Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today we're talking with Elizabeth Knox about getting accommodations in law school. Your Law School Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan and Lee Burgess. That's me. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website Career Dicta. Allison also runs the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. And with that, let's get started. Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we are talking to Elizabeth Knox, a disability consultant who we are lucky enough to have working with us as a tutor for the Law School Toolbox and the Bar Exam Toolbox. So Elizabeth, thanks for joining us on the Law School Toolbox podcast. I know we've already gotten to chat on the Bar Exam Toolbox podcast. Happy to be back. So first, I'd like to dive in um, to talk a little bit about how students can navigate their own advocacy, because I think this is really something that we see when students are in need of accommodations, they often don't know how to advocate for themselves. Um, And so what are kind of students, what should students first start thinking about if they see some signs that they might need accommodations or maybe they're going into law school even knowing that they have accommodations? I think first of all, it's important to acknowledge that the first year of law school is difficult for everyone. It can feel overwhelming. Um, The style of teaching and lecturing is just very different from what you'll have in undergrad. And so I think that even if you had accommodations in undergrad, you might not feel like you need them in law school. You might mm-hmm. think it's a professional school. I don't need this, but I say go in with an open mind. You might need them, and that's okay. There's no issue with getting what you need to be on the same playing field as everyone else in your class. Mm-hmm. But you also may have coasted through undergrad without ever realizing that you might need accommodations for you know graduate school or professional school. And so that's going to look different for each student. So I would say if you get toward the middle of the semester and you're just feeling completely overwhelmed and you're not, you know, processing what's happening and, you know, you feel like, uh, well, you're always going to feel like the grass is greener on the other side. Your classmates get this. I mean, that's a totally normal feeling. It's imposter syndrome. We all have it. But I think there's something extra, you know, in some cases, in many cases, where you're really not getting it or you're going home and you're just feeling completely defeated and and you don't know what to do next. And then it's time to start thinking about accommodations for different issues you might be uh, needing to address. I mean, I think everyone's overwhelmed, but, you know, I think you'll have a sense of this is more than overwhelmed. Yeah, and I think um, maybe it's a good point to... Um, also talk about that there are lots of different categories that fall into this kind of accommodations realm. We have um, things like you were just talking about as maybe a new diagnosis or something maybe around a learning difference or stress or anxiety, or anxiety clinical anxiety is something that, um, that oftentimes students get accommodations for. But we also have any sort of physical disability. We have students who um, get special accommodations for, you know, they need to be able to stand. They may have wrist injuries. They may need accommodations for hearing loss. They may need accommodations for vision. Um, there are lots and lots of different ways that you may need accommodation. Right. You know, or, you know, we also have had students who get pregnant and then they all of a sudden need accommodations for pregnancy. So, there's kind of like this moving target with all of this stuff. And, and I think a lot of times people forget that there is a way to um, move through the processes in your school, but you got to start to like figure out what's available to you based on your needs. Exactly. And I think I, I sort of went into this discussion under the assumption that if someone has a physical disability or hearing loss or, you know, vision right. loss or something like that, they're going to know that. That's true. They're gonna <laughs> that they're going to request it. So I guess I'm, working with the presumption that someone is discovering that they may need accommodations for the first time. Mm-hmm. Where I, you know, like I'm, I have a profound hearing loss. I knew well in advance that I would need certain things. Right. But. but I definitely have had students who, let's say, um, go through some sort of medical emergency in law school, and then they don't realize that with that may come the need for even um, accommodations around that. So I've had Absolutely. students who've had heart trouble and that, that they need certain accommodations for that or they're on certain meds or even little things like maybe your school doesn't allow you to drink water during 
an exam and you need to be able to have the allowance to drink water. I mean, there are all sorts of things. Um, so if you are, you know, dealing with something new or for a lot of people like pregnancy or maybe you're a nursing mom, there can be lots of different things that kind of come up um, that I think students often forget that they can ask for accommodations for. Right. I mean, my appendix ruptured during 3L, which was a lot of fun. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and I had a scheduled internship in Washington, D.C. that I needed to get down to for the January term and uh, ruptured the day after Christmas. So I was like, well, what are we going to do? And so I had to work with a lot of different people in the school to shift the internship and make sure I could do part of it from home. And mm-hmm. it was just a, it was a hassle, but they were able to work with me and it worked out just fine. Yeah. It was just, but, I mean, that kind of stuff comes up. It happens. Oh, and yeah. you eat resources that are available to you. Mm-hmm. For sure. So going back to kind of the student who maybe is struggling, and so this is a new disability or a new learning difference that they didn't, you know, plan for or have uh, no go into law school knowing about. Um, how much harder is it to typically get accommodations in law school if the student doesn't have a history of needing those accommodations? It's a, it can be a challenge. You, you do have to, you know, show them that this is something new and that it's not something you're manufacturing, I guess, to get accommodations. But um, I, I think that's the, the fact of someone manufacturing some, a disability is really rare and it's not likely to affect your ability to get accommodations. But I think uh, it's really important just to have frank, open conversations with the disabilities office or your mm-hmm. dean and let them know what's going on in your life, why this is particularly difficult. Um, I would say I'm not sure that I would go to the professor first. I would mm-hmm. go to the administrative staff first because they're more, they're much better situated to help you than your professor ever will be. Mm-hmm. I would just start documenting your difficulties, and if you already have an outside you know, therapist or doctor who is aware of these issues, have them write it down. Um, if not, then, you know, the, the disability office may ask you to obtain the documentation, and it's a matter of just creating a paper trail. And right. you want to do this as early as possible so you can learn as much as possible, of course. Right. And for learning differences, things like ADHD, which we see all the time kind of manifest in law school, um, oftentimes you have to go through some sort of academic testing to get that documentation that the school needs, especially to get things like extended time. And that doesn't exactly happen quickly. Well, nothing in this realm seems to happen quickly. (laughs) I guess if you have a sudden hearing loss or, you know, know, yeah. Yeah. And so as soon as you're getting an inkling that something is um, not feeling right to you, you want to start moving things along um, because Unfortunately, sometimes these things can be expensive, but it can also take a lot of time to get everything lined up. Um, and exams come up really quickly in law school. I think a lot of times people say, oh, late November, oh, December. But um, I'm still, we're recording this in early October, and I'm still completely flummoxed that it's October. I just, I can't process that information. And Thanksgiving is not that far away. <laughs> so. Oh, cool. Cool. Time flies. I mean, that's why you want to really, if you have any inkling of something being up, you want to mm-hmm. start taking action, documenting your own, you know, day, in a diary or journal or something at least. So you have some sort of record of what's been going on. And, you know, I've even heard professors recommending, you know, why don't you go talk to the disabilities office? Just, you know, go have a chat. See what's up. Maybe they can help you with, you know, what sounds to be an unreasonable struggle during office hours. or. Right. I mean, listen to what's going on and listen to yourself and, you know, move as quick as you can, which I know can be overwhelming when you have so much going on during 1L or any other semester, really. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think a lot of times students don't even appreciate that there are a wide variety of accommodations that might be available to them. I think most people know about extended time because I think that gets discussed a lot. But what other types of accommodations have you seen be common for students in the law school experience? Um, I know many people get note takers. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes you do, some people have, you know, an auditory processing disorder where they can't write and hear at the same time. Note takers and easy, well, not easy fix, but it's a part of a solution for that. Um, you might need, you know, extended time off from school if you're not mm-hmm. if you have a disability that requires you to have more bed rest than others. But then in that case, you would need uh, maybe recorded classes or a transcript mm-hmm. in the class or, again, a note taker, even though that doesn't fill in the full picture. Uh, maybe if your professor does um, PowerPoints, you know, having access to the PowerPoint decks, if they don't give it to everybody, you know, they can mm-hmm. give it to you. 
there's lots of different things you can do to try to fill in the gaps. Right. And during exam time, sometimes it can be taking it in a private room. Um, If distraction is an issue, we see that pretty commonly outside of extended time. Like I mentioned, being able to drink water or take a snack break. Um, You know, nursing moms sometimes need to pump in the middle of um, of an exam session, depending on how long it is. And, um, you know, so I think one of the things that I've seen students kind of miss out on is you have to work with the team who's supporting you, whether that's a medical doctor or it's a therapist or, you know, whoever is kind of supporting you in this, they need to help you be very direct about what you're asking for. Because what I have seen, and I don't know if you've seen this too, is if you're squishy on what you're asking for, then they won't give, they're not going to get creative to be like, I wonder how we can make this better for this student. They're going to say, what are you asking for? And then I will decide if we're going to be able to give it to you. (laughs) I mean, I, I give them all the benefit of the, of the doubt. I think they want all their students to learn and have a great right. experience, ultimately pass the bar exam. But, you know, it's not their job to figure out what you need. It's your yeah. job to self-advocate, figure out what will get you back on the path to success. And it's going to look different for every student, for every mm-hmm. nursing mom. I mean, right. the amount of time you need, it's going to be really different. And, you know, I think I've seen a lot of students get hung up on this idea that it's going to reflect badly on them um, if they kind of do this advocacy for themselves because they think that it will look like to the school or that they um, need some special help or to maybe their student, their other students might know something or, you know. I think there's, because everybody's so worried about their image and competition in law school, I think there's a lot of fear. So how do you kind of recommend that people deal with those thoughts of worry about, you know, how this advocacy for themselves might reflect badly on them? I know uh, I've had a lot of clients really worried about stigma. They don't want their classmates to know that they're getting extra time. They don't want their professors to know they're getting extra time. And the good news is with I'm grading, their professors won't know. Mm -hmm. And also, the good news is with the stress of exams, people don't even remember to shower. They're certainly not going to notice who's in the room and who's not in the room. So true. So. I could, yeah. <laughs> I could never tell you who wasn't in my room for <laughs> for an exam. That's yeah, the last thing I would have noticed. Like, oh, Sally's not in the room today. I bet she's getting extended time. Right. Like, I don't care what Sally is doing. All I, I want to do is survive this. Yeah. And I... And I yeah, and I was a note taker, um, and I was one of the people that Disability Services hired to give out notes. And if anything, I think even that role, it just made me pay more attention in class and be a better law student. So I think that role of the student needing that accommodation just made me better because I couldn't give them notes that I was taking while I was reading a blog post in the middle of class instead of paying attention. But I think that, you know, it's a natural concern. You don't want your potential future colleague to necessarily prejudge your abilities based on what you are or aren't doing. But, you know, ultimately, uh, to make professional colleagues, you have to do well in school. Right. So yeah. the first goal is to get through. And really, uh, you're thinking about yourself a lot more than everyone else is thinking about you. I think it's something I try to reinforce over and over with my clients. Like, mm-hmm. it feels overwhelming. It feels like you know, everyone's scrutinizing you, but really no one is. Yeah. And if they are, then that's on them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what about students who find that the, you know, traditional mode of teaching in law school, so the Socratic method, being called on, cold called on in class, um, really goes against the way that they feel like they're going to be successful. Um, you know, maybe maybe this is just really introducing anxiety and making it kind of impossible um, for them to learn. Maybe they've gone to the professor and talked to them about that, but the professor's old school and was kind of like, toughen up. This is part of life. Like, what do students do? Is Do they give up then, or do they still have to keep working to try and make it work for them? I think that is such a hard situation, mm-hmm. and there's no one great answer to that. It's going to be so professor dependent because I had, you know, professors who would, if you just look like you weren't ready for a cold call, they passed over you. Right. But then I had others who were very meticulous about, okay, now it's everyone who's wearing yellow's turn the today or everyone who, and it's just so random, you know, you yeah. just, and that's one of the horrors and joys of law school, I guess. But um, I think that, you know, you do the best you can to brief your cases so you are ready. You come up with coping strategies. Um, and I think it's really important to try to pay attention in class and mm-hmm. focus on what the person before you said 
which I know can be incredibly challenging when, you know, you have a class of 80 and they're in the back of the room and you have no idea what they said. And then the professor comes at you with, well, what's your response to so-and-so? It's like, ah, ah, (laughs) it. But, um, no, I think that many, more and more professors are accommodating of, you know, what, how, how students are reacting and they're, I think there's a shift toward making things more equitable in the class so you know when you're going to be cold called you're mm-hmm. on a panel. Right. Unfortunately, it's not everyone yet, but it, it is getting better and I hope that all professors sort of adopt that model so that way at least it takes away the stress and surprise element. Mm-hmm. But and I think the best you can do is maybe shoot an email to the professor like, look, I've read, I'm very interested in this and I want you to know that I know all this stuff. Um, maybe can I come to office hours and talk with you about it instead of being cold called? I right. really, I need it for X, Y, Z reasons. Um, I think you just have to get creative and it's going to be incredibly professor dependent. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. You know, you have to, and sometimes you won't know how the professor is going to react. I think I recently got a note from someone who had listened to one of our podcast episodes about going to office hours. And she said, I would have never gone to talk to this very intimidating professor if you hadn't yeah. done this podcast, but then they were really nice <laughs> in office hours. Nice. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. So you can't be sure they're not going to be accommodating if you go no. to them. I, and I think also if you if there's a participation grade, it's usually a pretty small portion of your grade, and the mm-hmm. final is blind. So right. In some classes, I was like, okay, well, the odds of me answering this question right are pretty darn low, but I'm just not going to worry about it. I'm going to prioritize, you know, getting the reading done and my outlining done. Right. Yeah. So one of the things that we have definitely had students deal with in the past is that their accommodations request lasts so long um, that it might not get done. Um, and dealt with before exam time or right up to the exam time. So um, does the student have any recourse to try and help rush this along or push the school um, to make a decision before exams? Um, I think that, you know, the dean's office will be very sensitive to that that fact and they understand why you want the exam. I think you can, you know, send emails and be the squeaky wheel. Yeah. Just ask. Keep yourself constantly show up in their offices, say, I need this, what's the status, to just follow up over and over and over. Mm-hmm. And you can always escalate, go up to the next level. And I've heard of people going all the way to the dean of the whole law school, like mm-hmm. I'm struggling and nobody's responding, can you help me? And that gets things done pretty quick. Yeah, that's true. Or it's, it's, a, it's also a struggle because, I mean, I think the expectation is that most students will have applied for accommodations in the summer before that gives time to gather all the documentation and stuff, but also your ability to gather the documentation is sort of limited. And I think, you know, there's different creative options and you can email the disability office, say, hey, can you help me file for, you know, a late exam? That That's a reasonable accommodation too. Mm-hmm. Can I take it when we come back after I have all this done? Mm-hmm. It's not a zero sum thing where you just fail your exam. Don't go into the exam ready to fail. That's not right. a good idea. At all. No. It's a lot easier to delay the exam than to let them get you to retake it because that's not going to happen right and I didn't even know that that was a possibility until I had a friend who'd had a sudden death in the family like days before the exams and she went to the school and the school allowed her to take the exams late and I, I remember just going like I would have never have even thought to ask for that you know and I think the school or a professor that she was close to was like you should you know you're having a hard time you shouldn't sit for your exams right now um, and that was very kind of them. Um, but I, I think that sometimes, you know, if you don't go to the school and express what's happening, you don't even know what's, what the options are on the table for you. Right. I definitely encourage that option. I mean, I had an illness in the family and they let me fly down to Texas during exams from Boston. I came mm-hmm. back and took them. Yeah. It was not deal. I mean, that different schools will have different policies, but you might be surprised by your school's flexibility on that front. Yeah. Sometimes people are nicer and more helpful than you think. <laughs> I think, I think as law students, we often assume everything's going to be so combative, um, yeah. and it's not always the case. Well, they're all watching their attrition numbers. They don't want anyone to drop out over an exam. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, we've also gotten some questions from listeners and students um, who've had medical issues come up, like you said, about having your appendix um, burst in law school, which sounds awful. 
Um, I had a student whose appendix burst while she was studying for the bar exam. So that was also awful. She passed though. She got, she managed to get it together. I know. Um, so what do you do if something like that happens in the semester? So you start missing classes or an exam. Um, how do you go about getting accommodations or talking to the school to handle that situation? I think it's a lot like we just talked about. You go to the dean of disability services or whoever is in charge of student life. You know, every school has a different name for this, but you tell them what's going on in your life and say, what are my options? What have students done in the past? You know, if you miss too many classes, then maybe it's time to take a withdrawal and Mm -hmm. extend your uh, stay at the law school by semester. That's totally reasonable, too, and can be very expensive, but uh, depending on when it happens in the semester, but... You have to look at the official policy, see how many classes you're allowed to miss. Mm -hmm. Some professors care not at all if you miss all their classes as long as you keep up. Right. Um, Others are sticklers. You can miss twice, and then, you know, we're going to have to have a talk before you're allowed to miss any more. I mean, I I had friends who had babies during law school, and they needed to take, you know, three weeks off, which is nothing, but enough to get back into class, um, and professors just work with them, make sure they got notes and mm-hmm. recorded classes. So it's, I think it's just important to be upfront with the school. They know what's going on. You're not just slacking off and missing for no reason. Right. Frank, honest conversation. And early. You know, I think when you find out kind of what's going on, you want to reach out to the school as early as you can. Because then, you know, you don't want them to be like, what happened to Lee? She's been gone for a month. And then you pop up again and say, oh, well, now I don't know what to do with this problem. You know, I think... It, they need to be part of, you know, that first line of communication. Absolutely. Um, you know, and I think that if you have any other situations, like you might have academic-based scholarships or things like that, you also want to make sure you're in communication with the school. So, you know, if you have to withdraw or if you have to delay your exams or something happens, you aren't at risk of possibly losing a scholarship or something that you're counting on. I know that different schools have very strict rules about who gets to keep the scholarships and under what conditions. Mm -hmm. And I know the the impression they get is that some schools are looking for reasons to take away the scholarships. Right. And in those cases, uh, it's really important to stay up front with them, so that way they have a that way they're on notice that it's for disability reason Mm -hmm. or. uh, Some other specific reason. I mean, if they have no notice, then they have no reason to honor that after the fact it's 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 a tough situation i don't it's going to vary state by state what you know they're allowed Mm -hmm. to do not allowed to do in terms of granting and denying continued scholarships yeah but more information is good because what you don't want is to plan on a scholarship and then having it disappear and then you don't have your funding in place for school a paper trail Mm -hmm. every time you talk to someone email them to confirm this is what we talked about Mm -hmm. i mean you want that in your back pocket always yeah keep things I see you know we always talk about Trello and Asana and all the tools that we use as a team I could see like a board where you like you know track all these conversations because it's very hard to keep up with all of this stuff and it's very hard especially if you're dealing with a stressful situation because our memories aren't at our best when we're super stressed right yeah they don't need to be you know gone to Paris for two months or in the hospital for a month they don't know yeah. Yeah, it's up to you to put that on their radar. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about the stigma around especially like mental health accommodations or learning differences accommodations. And I have definitely had students in the past who refused to get accommodations because they were worried about the stigma and that I think hurt their grades. It took them longer to pass the bar exam. I think, you know, it didn't matter how many times I had this conversation with this individual student years, I mean, like three or four years, I still couldn't, uh, I never won. I never won. But um, I think that, you know, we already talked about how most other students are not paying attention to your accommodations, because everybody's very narcissistic and self absorbed. Um, But, you know, how do students want to start learning the language to talk about these accommodations if it does come up with either other students or another professor or anything like that? Sorry, can you repeat that last Oh, just um, like how students should kind of work on learning language to talk about their accommodations in a way with other students or other professors if it comes up. Because I think a lot of students are worried that they want to talk about it in the right way and not have it look reflect poorly on them. Right. Um, And I 
that's always going to be a personal decision for someone to make. I mean, there's no reason ever to share with your classmates if you don't want to. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's totally up to you. Um, a lot of accommodations are invisible. I mean, like I said, nobody notices who's getting time and a half in a different room or needs a bathroom break or needs to take medication in the middle of the exam. Nobody knows any of this. I mean, that's totally up to you. And I think we're increasingly at a time where people are comfortable talking about their disabilities. Mm -hmm. And that's great, but that doesn't mean everyone is. And everyone shouldn't have to be because it's a very personal decision to make. Um, In terms of talking to professors, I would say if it affects your class performance, that's something you might want to introduce to them uh, in a way that says, you know, I'm committed to this class, I'm capable, I'm going to do the work, but I need you to know that if it looks like I'm zoning out for whatever reason, it's not because I'm ignoring you, it's because I'm trying to process what I'm hearing, or, you know, I sometimes need to take breaks in the middle of class so that I can come back in fully engaged. I think there's different ways to handle that conversation depending on the professor. And Mm -hmm. ideally, you won't need to because the class will just go on on without, yeah. But but some professors have rules about how many times you can leave the classroom. And I think in that case, you need to address it. Obviously, you have the Dean of Disability Services do it. Um, I think that there I mean, there are visible accommodations. I had a uh, captioner come with me to all my classes, and people were very interested in this. Like, oh, what is this? Can I get a, a copy of your transcript, too? Mm-hmm. And I well, I don't even get a copy of the transcript, usually, so no, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, it's not a thing that we can do, because that's the professor's intellectual property. It's their words, and right. this is just accommodation so uh, it ended up you know, a lot of funny interactions like oh who is this why why do we have a court reporter in the classroom <laughs> I mean, some accommodations are just obvious and you just work around that and you just I think a sense of humor always helps mm-hmm. yeah and it is funny when we were talking about people noticing things in exams I know some of my friends had accommodations for various things I could not tell you anyone in my class with accommodations but I could tell you the person who like lined up little figurines on their desk during the exams like they had she had like a whole u-shaped figurine thing yeah. I'm like so you know I think that when we think about what people are paying attention to I was more interested in the figurines and two rows up for me than who was or was not there or who you know who was sitting closer to the bathroom or you know whatever it might be yeah I mean you don't know if someone has the flu you don't want them in there right I mean like different things it's just not I think that you know going back to what we said earlier people are not paying attention to you generally as yeah. much as you think they are that's true Another thing that we've heard from some students, especially those who get extended time, is that they worry that the extra time could actually work to their de- um, detriment because they might overthink or not manage their time well or almost have too much time. So if a student has concerns about that, so like isn't going to reach out for accommodations, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's always better to have the accommodation and reject it. Yeah. It's always, always. It's never worth, you know, not seeking it out because you don't think you'll use it. Right. So you don't know how your mind will change in November. Um, you may realize, wow, it's a lot more text than I thought it was in mm-hmm. my uh, and that I can use for this open book exam. I cannot possibly read this much. Right. Um, but, you know, if you don't use it, you don't use it. You can turn in your exam whenever you want. Right. And so. I've. I've had students come up with really creative ways to make the most of that time, too. I've had students with ADHD who've done full meditation mindfulness exercises to refocus their minds or, you know, move their bodies or stand up or stretch or do. There are so many things that you can do during that time to help you perform at your best um, that that I think people forget about, (laughs) you know. And I once again would urge people to practice for the exam in the way that you will take the exam so that you have a real sense of what you know you're going to need in the exam room so don't necessarily take every practice exam in bed you know with hot chocolate next to you Um, put your stressful environment in the library where there's people walking and rustling around and right of course you know you're taking your exam at home then go for it right (laughs) that's how you take it anyway but just different, you know, methods of preparing for the test that should show you what you'll need and you should have a pretty good sense by exam time whether you'll need that extended time or not. 
And if you are having trouble coming up with these kind of individualized solutions based on your accommodations, I do think that this is where having a tutor or going to your academic support office to brainstorm the ways to really help yourself perform at your best under these new conditions is very important. Um, because sometimes you haven't thought about doing a mindfulness meditation in the middle or um, you're having trouble figuring out. I've worked with a lot of students, especially with ADHD, where one of our jobs is to pinpoint kind of w that point where it falls apart. You know, there's always seems to be like a point where the focus starts to wane. And so, you know, breaking right. it up into smaller chunks so you can refocus and do activities to refocus and things like that, that can be hard to do on your own. And Absolutely. so, you know, so getting the right help, whether through your school or through an external group like ours, can give you the opportunity to have someone else help you develop this plan. So once you've, you know, fought and advocated to get these accommodations, they can help you be at your best. Absolutely. And I think having a great educational consultant is invaluable. Uh, yeah. Someone who sees this every day, all day. And another thing I know some really successful students have done is ask their dean of disability services to put them in touch with students who may have already graduated mm -hmm. who have a similar disability but did well in law school so they can just ping ideas off. I've had students email me about, you know, how do I cope with different issues that come up with hearing loss and I love it. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to it's great mm -hmm. and, it's there, and the dean always facilitates the conversation do you mind talking to so-and-so it's like of course not you know it's, it's never just a blind you know call mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's good and then you expand your network anyway which is great so right and we're all learning I mean even since you and I have been working together I I have learned a lot about how you know working with someone who has a perhaps found a hearing loss we've worked with students who've had hearing losses and I feel like the more I learn by having these conversations, the better I am to support students in that way. Um, and, you know, we're all, we're all learning, right? <laughs> so it's like, we have to all talk about this stuff. So, you know, we can even learn, you know, different ways we can accommodate. And, and I think that it doesn't have to make anything harder, even if it's just, you know, a little bit different or a little tweak of how you do something, it can make a big difference for another student or someone you work with. And I think it's it's kind of an amazing thing when we all are open and able to talk about this stuff without judgment. I think it's wonderful. And then the more we do it, the better. And then more creative solutions everyone will have. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we have done another podcast on the bar exam toolbox podcast just to put a teaser out there you can check it out as well um because bar exam accommodations are such a big deal and um so you know we've got questions a lot of law students are worried about um getting those accommodations for the bar so if you have accommodations in law school do you typically get them for the bar exam not typically unless you ask for them <laughs> fair point <laughs> Uh, you have to ask for them, and the better documentation you have of whatever accommodations you got in law school, the better. So um, if you have a long record of getting extended time on exams and on the LSAT and other standardized tests, your odds of getting approved on the bar exam are much, much higher. Like it's another one of those things where you want to start early, just like law school accommodations. Right. And by let's because of this happens to a lot of students. They don't know what the word early means, so let's be very specific for them. If you're taking the July exam, May is not yeah. early. That is not early. People think May is early. It is not early. May is not early. The day, you know, I think Texas, the application's open December, that's early. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, if you do it early, you're going to find out early, and that's great. If you do yeah. it late, um, no. especially, yeah, it's, sometimes you won't get the answer until days sometimes yeah. two days before the test which is really stressful also you lose your right to appeal for that round um, and I've had a lot of students have success with accommodations appeals um, but you lose your opportunity to appeal if you do it at the last minute so this is not the most fun thing to do but if this is something that you need um, you know, it's very important to do it. And I also think that one of the things you mentioned in that podcast that I've really thought about since then is the um, need to put the bar on notice if yeah. you've got something going on and this idea that even if you aren't sure, um, I think pregnancy is a great example, you know, putting the bar on notice that you're pregnant and that you may need certain accommodations early is better than at the end trying to scramble 
because now you have a sciatic nerve problem and you need to be able to take breaks because you're in continual pain, you know? Yeah. Probably not going to provide an outlet at in on the table, you know, in the big room for you to pump. They're just not. Right. Be a <laughs> right. And I'm a big fan of pumping out anywhere, but inside the bar exam room, probably not <laughs> in the middle of the test. You're not. That's just not a pleasant. <laughs> no. You're like, you're like, excuse me, just li- just just give me a second here. No spilling milk, you know. <laughs> I know. So yeah, the, the the earlier the better. I mean, I wouldn't say you need to tell them at like five weeks pregnant, no. but you know, uh, if you know that your pregnancy is advancing along and you're probably going to nurse, then. You, you need to tell them. Right. Yeah. And then yeah. it just makes it easier for them to have the documentation from your doctors or whatever they need. Um, and for you to understand what they, what you need. So if your needs change, the, right. they're, they're not going, well, now we need to go back to the beginning. Are you even pregnant? Where's that letter? You know, <laughs> cause these big bureaucracies, they do not move fast. It's a lot easier to undo an accommodation than to get it later. That's a very good point. Yeah. So if a student has applied for accommodations and they haven't gotten word back yet, so they're into their study period, they don't know if the bar is going to give them that extended time. Do you study like you're going to get them or is that foolish? No, study. I mean, like it's easier to study again later. Go ahead and start the study program. Yeah. Um, and also keep nagging the bar people because they, they're real humans there. You can call them. Yeah. Like we uh, yeah, and I think absolutely go forward like you're going to get the accommodation because what if you get it and then you haven't studied? Yeah, and I think so, if, really- and if there's ambiguity around whether or not you are going to get extended time, sometimes what I will tell folks is that they need to study under regular time conditions right. um, and maybe do a little practice with extended time. But, you know, generally speaking, the extended time is going to be easier easier yeah. so ish study the worst case scenario yeah that's a great way to put it yeah just like in any exam situation if you know you're going to be in a loud place study in the loud place or mm-hmm. just try to get as much as possible yeah timing element so um one other kind of i want to I want to touch on this other topic, but I think we're going to do a future podcast on this topic. But if you need accommodations, let's say for a hearing loss or a physical accommodation or um, something along those lines, and you're doing job interviews, um, okay. how do students would need to deal with accommodations in job interviews? Do you use your school's recruiting office to help with that? Do you talk to the firms? Like, how is it best to navigate the job process? I think that's also going to vary based on the disability, but if you're doing, like, OCI, where you're not going to have a chance to talk to every firm because mm-hmm. you're doing rapid-fire interviews, right? and I would talk to your school uh, office or uh, hiring careers office to see, you know, what the best practice is there. Because maybe they could put out a blanket notice to all your interviewers, hey, you guys have a deaf or vision-impaired or whatever, you know, person coming through, uh, and you need to know this is what to expect. Okay. So, you don't want to. I think those interviews are really short. You're not going to want to spend the interview talking about your the accommodation you need. You want to right. have it in place, um, and that's just a, a specific kind of interview. For your average interview, where you set it up yourself and you go somewhere and you know talk to a judge or talk to anyone else um, in an HR office, then you would just have to weigh it out. Do I need an accommodation during the interview? What does that look like? And what is the most uh, reasonable way to ask for it? Mm-hmm. And but if you don't need an interview, but uh, interview accommodation, I'm sorry, but you do need a job accommodation, I, you know, you might want to think about waiting until after you have an offer. Be like, by the way, I'm also going to need a standing desk or mm-hmm. a specific, whatever, different accommodation. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, there's no reason you can't bring it up during the interview, but there's a lot of other things to take into consideration before you do that. Right. Like the interview is supposed to be showcasing what you can do yeah. well, or like why you're going to fit their office best, or it's just a bragging period. So <laughs> you do focus on that more than, oh, this is what we're going to need to do immediately. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really good to take into consideration. Well, as we wind up here, I think a couple of the messages that I've heard through our discussion today is that you know, ask early and often, you know, if there's something that you need to level the playing field, 
you know, try and worry less about how it's going to make you look and try and just advocate early and often. And the earlier that you do these things, the more likely it is you're going to get what you need, but it's also going to not reflect back on you because everybody appreciates advocating for themselves. They don't love when people do things at the last minute, but if you are on the ball and showing that you've got this under control, I think that's going to give you the highest likelihood of success. And, you know, if you need more documentation or an appeal, you you have room for that. Right. Any other final thoughts that you want law students to think about, about getting their accommodations? I think just focus on the fact that while there is still stigma involved with many disabilities, most students are not actually paying attention to you. It's a main takeaway always. And also, like you said, act early and often. Yeah. The more you practice self-advocacy, the easier it gets. Absolutely. And let's all just keep talking to each other about how best we can work together. Because I think that the more we all talk about um, our each individual needs and um, how we can collaborate together best, then that's going to change the workforce and we can really change the stigma going forward. And I think it's exciting to see how law schools are adapting to mental health issues and really being proactive about it. I mean, they want you to reach out before it becomes a crisis to do that. I mean, pay attention to what's going on with your classmates, with yourself, to just be there, be open and ready to jump in and help and be willing to get help when you need it. And I think that's just something we all forget that, you know, we get wrapped up into our own lives and the side of things, but there are programs in place ready to go. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, we are out of time. Thanks, Elizabeth, for coming on and talking to us about this very important issue. And we look forward to talking more about it in the future. Great. If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and rating on your favorite listening app. We'd really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Allison at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or allison at lawschooltoolbox.com. Or you can always contact us via our website contact form at lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening and we'll talk soon. Mm -hmm.